You have this amazing power to move people, not just to think, but to feel. When did you realize you had the ability to do that? I think everybody has the ability to feel, right? You know, that, that wasn't a, a great gift. I think I just feel so much, and I feel so much what people feel. Um, when uh, my youngest son, I remember when I was really young even, uh, came in and he'd bring his friends and go, watch my dad watch this movie. And I'd be like, you know, don't open the door. You know, I just can't help myself. I feel what they feel. And so that produced a lot of drive in me to help people when they were in pain because I feel their pain. And even when I was a little kid, I mean, my mom reminded me when I was like four years old, I'm in this backyard and there was a, a woman next door I used to call young lady and she was 80 years old. But, you know, seeing her light up when I called her young lady, I got hooked on at four or five years old. So... I love that, and because I'm driven for that, my lifetime has been about how to help people, how to help people achieve what they want, break through, discover things, and you can be an idiot if you spend three or four decades, in my case, it's been three and a half decades now, you know, being obsessed about that, and then when you get rewarded all the time, because people, you know, people are incredibly generous when they feel like you've touched their life, they, they send out a lot of love, and I'm a love bug, so I got hooked on that at a very early stage of life, and I still am. You specialize in a lot of different areas, health, business, politics, sports, all kinds of areas. Of all the areas, what's the most challenging to move people, to move people to be active in their own rescue? It's a great term, active in their own rescue. You and I both have some history with that one, right. going down the Colorado River. Right. It's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody has their hooks. Everybody's different, Peter. Um, you know, some people, yeah, it's their business, their finances. You know, if that gets hooked, it's like their identity is tied to that. Uh, for other people, it's their body. They just feel like it's impossible. They can't change anything. They've, they've gone into learned helplessness, where they just have literally learned that they're helpless. They can't do anything about it because they failed so often. Um, but if I had to pick one that probably is most fraught for people overall, it's really intimate love and romance because you can control your business to some extent because you can control you. You can control your finances to some extent, right, by your choices. But you can do everything you want to do in an intimate relationship, and it can still blow up in your face because you can't control another human being, and if you could, you'd have no relationship. So, and I also think that if there's a story that all human beings have, it's the story of fear. We all have what we're after, but everybody has fears. And I've been with, you know, 4 million people now from 100 countries over these, you know, 33, 34 years I've been involved with people now, and... I can tell you all roads lead to Rome. Whatever you're afraid of, you're afraid of failing or succeeding or whatever the case may be, it really comes down to a fear that we're not enough. And if we fear we're not enough, our ultimate fear is if we're not enough, we won't be loved. Who can produce that fear in you more than somebody whose love you crave? Somebody that you really want them and they all of a sudden don't love you as much anymore? It crushes the soul. So most people have these plans like I'll be successful and then I'll know I'm enough regardless of what someone else does to me. Or, you know, I'll be strong enough or physically beautiful enough. But, of course, all those things are relative and none of them last. So getting people to have the courage and the faith to realize there, there is no security in life and there's no security in relationship. There's only what you can contribute. There's only what you can create. And getting people to that place is not an easy thing to do. But when they do it, it opens up a whole new universe because when somebody's in love, you know, what's wrong with your life? You know, nothing, you know, oh, what a beautiful morning, doesn't matter, you're silly as hell. But when they don't have that love in their life and everything else is going well, they still come to that empty place inside at the end. And that's the place where the most successful people on earth that have been clients of mine, you know, everybody thinks is so incredible. That's where they're lonely still very often. And that's the area that you got to really dig in to help someone. Do they usually have a story that happened to them very young, which is kind of a, a backstory, a seminal element that is still present in them 10, 20, 30 years later? and preventing them from exercising those talents? Well, nothing's preventing them, but they choose to go back to that story, right? Because how many stories do we have in our lives? But we have certain seminal ones that have so much emotion wrapped up into them, so much pain, so much hurt, or so much excitement that they shape us, and everybody's got those. I always say, change your story, change your life. Because whatever your story is becomes the shaper of all your perceptions, what you're gonna try or not try, do or not do. The problem is most people are so addicted to telling that same story over and over again, it does become their prison. And so the answer is yes. I think the oldest story is that all of us were loved unconditionally when we were born. Uh, you know that even if you thought you had the worst mother in the world because, you know, if a baby doesn't have someone willing to love them, that is means take care of them above their own needs. There's no rewards for a mother, ooh and ah, for all that stuff, for a father, <laughs> ooh and ah. You know, we, we feel it because we're on drugs. We got oxytocin in our body. As soon as we're 
a woman's pregnant or a father's there and he sees his child, that biochemistry changes in us and we love that thing even though it looks like a lizard, right? It doesn't right. matter. We know it's our kid. So, but that doesn't last forever. There's a stage in your life where you could yell, scream, throw stuff, smack people, and you still were taken care of in love. But then there's a day when that oxytocin wears off, and suddenly somebody yells at you or hits you or even worse, ignores you. And that's the moment when the ultimate story is, what do I do to get that attention back? What do I do to get that love? And so some people, you know, they suddenly try to crawl or walk. And everybody goes, look, Johnny's walking, and the story is, I'm an achiever. I do things so I'm significant enough to get attention and love. Some people break stuff and people come and they learn if I destroy stuff, that's my story, then I'll get unconsciously this love. Some people, you know, they go, they make some noise and everybody laughs, make some noise, and a comedian's born. So that story, that experience becomes the story of what I've got to do when I feel uncertain that I'm significant enough to be worthy of attention and love in this life. And I'm oversimplifying it, obviously, because we've had a lot of series of stories in our life. But if we can go back and reclaim who we are today instead of living an old story, everything in your life changes. And that's a part of what I do. I recall the President of the United States calling you. Remember, you were going to see Princess Diana, Mikhail yeah. Gorbachev, all these people that are extremely successful, extremely talented. Did they all have backstories that ran them? Did they all have some element in them, despite their success, that was still in the back of their head, still telling them, you're not good enough, you are good enough, or some, some element of their life that wasn't working because of that? Well, I don't always get the call because somebody's got, you know, some emotional problem or challenge. You know, when the president called, you gave me a lot of crap for what I said to him <laughs> at that time, which was, I said something like, you know, I'm really appreciative of your calling, and, but I'm not a fan at that right. stage. Uh, so if you still want to hear from me, I'd love to come and do some coaching with you. So I was rather direct with him. But no, um, everybody's got parts of their life that shape the way they look at today and how they behave today. Everybody does. Everybody has a backstory, multiple backstories. The question is, which one's running you now? But what I'd say the common backstory for the successful people is hunger. Something produced drive in them. If you say, what's the difference in human beings and how they perform and how they show up, it's not intelligence or ability. You can find somebody with plenty of intelligence and ability and they don't maximize. They can't fight their way out of a paper bag. And then you find this other person that finds this hunger inside. You have it. I have it. Almost anyone we know who has done something they're proud of in their life or they feel good about in their life, they had to get through all the obstacles. They had to get through their own limiting stories, and so there had to be something they wanted more. That hunger often comes from a story of frustration or pain or desire. And finding that touchstone and igniting it is how you often can take somebody who's not driven and hungry and really help them to change their life. Do you think that people are empowered when they hear that somebody of that high stature also has some of those same problems and some of those backstories that are handicapping them? It's a great question. Um, some people are. Some people use it as a reason to hang on to their old story. Ooh, very cool. Right? Because yeah. they go, well, if, I, if Bill Clinton has that experience, right. you know, if you know, Tony Robbins has that experience, then what the heck am I going to do? And that's, that's part of the challenges. It's like, I remember one time... Um, it was, it was fascinating. My own sister, um, something was going on. It was challenging and everything else. And I said, you know, how come you didn't call me? And she goes, well, because you're Tony Robbins. <laughs> like, what does that mean? She goes, well, you can handle it. You know, I was going through a really rough situation. Right. I had a similar experience with one of my boys, with my, my son Josh one time. He says, well, Dad, you're Tony Robbins, right? People make up this story because they don't know the real backstory. You know, you and I know each other's backstories. Mm -hmm. You and I know that we didn't just show up this way. Um, we've had a lot of gifts in our life, but... We've paid the price to do it, and we've found a way to add value throughout life, and that's why we have the privilege to be here. But if you start thinking that everybody's messed up, then it gives you an excuse to stay messed up. Wow. Versus my view is, let me tell you what these people overcame to be where they are. Right. That's what I'm more interested in, so that you and I have something to aspire to, because stories will either give you some form of aspiration, some inspiration, or they give you an excuse to stay where you are, or even make it worse.